Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Neoliberal Podcast, part of the Center for New Liberalism. I'm your host, Jeremiah Johnson, and joining us today is Richard Reeves. Richard is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and the director of the Future of the Middle Class Initiative, and he's also the author of the new book, Of Boys and Men. It's a book about why boys and men are struggling in many ways in today's society, why that's happening, and what we can do about it. So, Richard, welcome to the show. Thanks, Jeremiah. I'm looking forward to this. I am looking forward to it very much as well. And I have to say, I really enjoyed the book. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's going to end up in our best books of 2022 podcast that we do in a couple months from now at the end of the Thank year. You. I had a little bit of an interesting experience in reading the first chapter of this book. You know, at the beginning of all these books, there's kind of the introductory chapter, which always talks about why you should care about this, whether it's a book about immigration or criminal justice or, you know, the Elizabethan poetry of the 1600s or whatever, like, why should I care? And you're, you're writing this in the way that most people do. Why should we care about the boys and men? And it's a pretty easy sell. It's half the population. If they're struggling, we should probably know and care about that. But there's a very defensive tone as you kind of write about this. Were you apprehensive writing this book because it kind of goes against the zeitgeist in, in some sense to, to write about boys and men explicitly as opposed to the problems women are facing? Well, I think it, it does on the center left. I think that would be much less true of the right. I mean, we've had books like Christina Hoff Summers, you know, the, the War Against Boys. There's a book, The War Against Men by Suzanne Venker and many politicians on the right kind of leaning into some of the the problems that boys and men are facing, I should say, without any solutions, purely in the service of the culture war. But I, I was aware that even raising the issue of boys and men is, it's a, is a task that has to be undertaken with a certain degree of care if you want it to be an inviting conversation, if you want people to come in, <laughs> if come in the door. And so I, I would use the word uh, fraught. It seems very fraught to do this. Yes, in, in center left and left circles. I think that's right. And actually, a number, you know, as I said, a number of people just advised against it. It's a, there's there's a degree of risk involved uh, simply in engaging in the project. And of course, it's a it's a it's a vicious circle. If the only people who are talking about this subject are those on the fringes, then you can say that it's a fringe subject. <laughs> but that's that's in a sense to smuggle your answer into your into your question. And so what I was trying to do was to write about this in you know, a fairly straightforward way, just here are the facts, to, to, for, that, that we can then argue about the facts, but lay them out. But also right from the outset to make it clear that we can think two thoughts at once, that simply engaging with the issues of boys and men does not require people to sort of leave at the door their prior convictions about the need to do more for women and girls. Certainly that's not what I've done. Uh, there are many areas where we still need to do much more for women and girls. And in a sense, create, <laughs> I hate to use the term, but create a safe space and, and try to allay the fear that people will understandably have that as soon as you raise these questions, they're thinking, where's he going with this? You know, where does this lead? Does this lead us into an anti-feminist, you know, men's rights kind of world? And so you have to head that off immediately. I think you just have to immediately head that off and so that we can sort of just all breathe a bit more easily and say, okay, fine, we're just having a, we're having a slightly more straightforward conversation. One of, the, one of the nicest descriptions of the book I've had so far was from Matthew Iglesias when he described the book as earnest, even banal. And in different circumstances, I'd be wounded by those comments. But this is an area that needs a bit of banality. It needs a little bit of like, here are some ordinary problems that we need to deal with. And it doesn't require us to stop dealing with other problems. It's not a zero-sum game. And it's not a culture war issue. It's just, here's some bad stuff that's happening to some people. Could we help them? And mm -hmm. in a sense, yeah. to make it a little bit more pedestrian. Well, I'll, I'll stop you there because there are some ways in which it is a culture war issue. And I think what you're saying is we shouldn't want it to be a culture war issue. Um, th there was a great quote in the book Correct. that I'd love to just share with everyone um, that said, you know, if, if there's a real issue in society and the responsible parties don't deal with it, then irresponsible parties will take advantage of it. Yeah, I think that's an. I mean, that's just an axiom of, of of political and cultural life, and this is this is perhaps just a particularly good example of it, where you can see that if 
if this issue is just neglected, just not discussed. So it's, it's the sort of the, the problems that dare not speak their name. If they're the problems afflicting boys and men, then that does just create a huge vacuum and a huge market that into which you can you can see various figures sweeping. I mean, I've actually been digging a little bit into the uh, the rise and perhaps fall of Andrew Tate. I don't know if you know anything about him. Only the the barest essentials of kind of the I, I know generally the space he fell in and that he was recently uh, canceled for some horrible behavior of some kind. But I, I don't actually know many of the details other than I I saw some news that he had been he did something terrible and was canceled. Yeah. Well, again, you see, the fact that we don't really know very much about him, I think, speaks more to the positions that we sit in. So, just uh, I'll I'll tell you that. Uh, at the beginning of the year, my youngest son said to me, "If you're going to write about boys and men, you've got to ha- you're going to have to write about Andrew Tate." And I said, "Who's Andrew Tate?" And so he showed me some videos and said, "He's this guy who used to be a kickboxer, and then he was on Big Brother, uh, and there were just these absurd, cartoonish, misogynistic uh, uh, clips on TikTok, especially." And I was like, "No, I really don't need to deal with him. I'm writing about Jordan Peterson." I'm writing about a bunch of people on the right. I really do not need to deal with this internet guy. And actually, in the months since, he's become such a phenomenon that he has, as you said, he's been deplatformed. He's been taken off every social media platform. But I was just looking at the trends, and throughout the whole of the summer, the Google search for Andrew Tate was much bigger than the Google search for recession. He's had, uh, I think it's 12 billion views on on uh, tick, through TikTok, etc. He's made millions. He's just this guy's a absolute, and there isn't a there isn't a young man or boy under the age of thirty, in, probably in either the UK or the US, who doesn't know who Andrew Tate is and hasn't had exposure to some of his content. And the guy's a phenomenon. It makes Jordan Peterson look look like timid in some ways. And in fact, my my view is that the rise of someone is kind of it's it's really horrible stuff in many cases. But he he's going to make liberals feel the same way about Jordan Peterson. The they started to feel about George W. Bush once Donald Trump came along. You know that moment when sort of liberals and progressives started thinking, oh, good, you know, George W. Bush, he wasn't such a bad guy. It's like, well, compared to Trump, he wasn't, but that wasn't what you were saying back then. And sort of by comparison to someone like Tate, Jordan Peterson is like a tweedy Canadian psychology professor. And what it tells us is that there's demand there. There's stuff there. It's out there. And, and the discontent and disorientation that a lot of young men and boys are feeling is not going away. So if we don't address it squarely, then there's all kinds of markets there, political markets, commercial markets that are going to get exploited. So I think we can come, we're going to circle back to this later, I think. Okay. Are we going to be boring first? Though? Y- yeah. <laughs> so let's do boring. Let's do, let's do banal before we do Andrew Tate, because he's- the Let's do that. Banal, which so is the problem. I think, I think one of the first things that we, before we circle back into culture war stuff, I think one of the first things we have to talk about is education. You talk at length in the book about the educational gap that is opened up between boys and girls and and that this exists in many different stages throughout the educational experience all the way from, you know, early childhood and kind of middle school education through college attainment and and PhD let programs. Can you give us an overview of what is the state of the of boys in education, I guess? Yeah, so the, the the basic version of this is that women and girls are have not only caught up with boys and men, but are blown right past them in pretty much every level of education and in pretty much every area of education and in pretty much every advanced economy. And the fact that it's so universal, I think, speaks to some structural problems, right? This is not just a problem with middle schools in the US, right? This is This is a much more general phenomenon. And so to put a couple of data points down on it, if you look at high school GPA, which is a good product and predictor of educational performance, and you rank those GPA scores, then the top 10% of GPA scorers are two, is two-thirds female. The bottom 10% is two-thirds male. When it comes to four-year college, women are now 15 percentage points more likely to get a four-year college degree than men, which is bigger than the gender gap we had in 1972 which was 13 points in favor of men. So the gender inequality in college education today is wider than in 1972. It's just the other way around. And so what's happened is since we've taken the brakes off and put the the barriers down for women and girls in education is that they've not just caught up but blown blown right past, which nobody predicted, by the way. And then if you just look at things like math and English scores, 
around the U.S. in particular, you'll see that girl in the average U.S. school district, girls are three quarters of a grade level ahead in English, and they're caught up in math. Uh, and in poorer school districts, uh, girls are even further ahead in English and uh, are ahead in math. And so there isn't there aren't you you have to look quite hard to find areas where boys and men are consistently ahead of women and girls now whereas of course you only have to go back 40 years 30 years 20 years in some cases to discover that the opposite was the case and so the gender inequality is reversed and is now large and in some cases widening and as you point out is now all the way from pre-k all the way through phd where women only just overtook men in phd achievement um, but they have overtaken now they're way they're way ahead in master's achievement and way way, way ahead in, in four-year four-year college degree achievement Reading the book is definitely this experience of like reading one shocking statistic after another about how, you know, like, well, Finland is supposed to have the best schools in the world, but really they're just good at educating girls and their boys are struggling like everywhere else. And the boy girl gap is as big or bigger than the rich versus poor student gap in some places. And it's like, there's a lot of data in this book. I do heavily recommend it if you're listening. And just, it, it feels like you're getting hit with one punch after another of like, just driving home that point like boys are really really struggling in education and i think it leads to the question the obvious question is why is this happening you know what what is actually the cause of this is it biological is it something about the way boys develop is it sociological is it something about like the systems that that we have for education yeah i think it's both i think the 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 irony of the success of the, the women's movement in taking the breaks off um, women's op educational opportunities and aspirations. And I think it's just, it's worth saying, just in case it isn't obvious, I hope it is, that, that we think that's a wonderful thing. It's just a huge liberation. Has been to expose the ways in which the education system actually slightly favors girls and women uh, on average uh, over boys and men. And that, that slight difference, of course, then can translate to some pretty big aggregate inequalities and biology is part of it because even though there's still a heated debate about the difference between female and male brains among adults there's no debate about the fact that girls brains develop earlier than boys and in particular ways in a particular time so girls hit puberty a bit earlier one result of that is that the prefrontal cortex in their brain develops uh, between a year and two years earlier than boys and the prefrontal cortex is sometimes called the ceo of the brain is the bit of the brain that has future orientation, that allows you to defer gratification, that's good at organization. It's the bit of your brain that makes you do your physics homework rather than playing Call of Duty or going out to a party. And it's the bit of your brain that, having done your homework, remembers to turn it in the next day. And it's the bit of your brain that cares about your high school GPA because that's going to affect your college going, which might affect your future. And those, those so-called soft skills or non-cognitive skills are partly related to brain development. And that just happens earlier in, in, um, in girls than in boys. And there's no real debate about that. What that means is that a 16-year-old girl and a 16-year-old boy, on average, and everything else equal, are not the same. The girl is somewhat more mature. And it's one of those findings that you can have all these charts and neuroscientific studies and, and to prove it. <laughs> and then you show it to parents and educators and they go, well, duh. One of my most liberal and most, uh, I would say, publicly feminist colleagues who read the book was like, well, I've got a son and a daughter. Tell me something I don't know. And so everyone knows this, but we've continued. We, we, it hasn't affected education policy yet. And it didn't, it didn't show up before because women and girls weren't encouraged, weren't encouraged to pursue educational excellence. They didn't go to college. And under conditions where, under conditions of sexism, where women and girls weren't, uh, weren't encouraged to go, you just couldn't see the ways in which the system, at least biologically, might be structured against them. So it's an irony that it took the women's movement to expose the ways in which the education system might actually somewhat disfavor boys and men. And then I'll just add a couple of other quick things. One is there's some evidence that having male teachers is good, particularly for, for, for boys. And we have fewer male teachers over time than we did, only 24% now. K-12 teachers are male, very few elementary school teachers. And also uh, an underinvestment in vocational forms of learning, which everything else equal do seem to favor boys a bit more than girls. And so it's both biology and the way the institutions work and the ethos of those kinds of institutions just means that everything else equal, the education system is a bit more female friendly than male friendly. 
I don't think that that's a particularly controversial statement. Uh, certainly when I've talked to educators and education policy people about it, there's a kind of broad agreement with that. And the question is, well, does it matter? And if so, what do we do about it? And I think we have to address both those questions before even those startling statistics should uh, galvanize us to action. I think, I think it does matter and that we should act, but uh, I do think it's important that we say why. When I think about this, I can't help but think about the Canadian hockey problem. And I think this is from um, Outliers, which is one of the really well-known kind of books of this type, this nonfiction kind of book that gives you interesting ex examples about the world. And what happens in Canada in hockey is that people born at the beginning of the year have a big advantage uh, in the hockey system because they're just literally older than people born at the end of the year. You know, if you're born in January of, you know, a certain year, you're 10 months older than somebody born in November of that year. And at age like six, that's a huge deal, right? Um, and, and, and especially when you're very, very young, that's like a massive deal. You're way more developed. And it's not that that 10 months matters once you're in high school, but it's the fact that you know, when you're six, you are identified as the one who's really good. And so you get all the practice time, you get the positive encouragement, you start and you're the star and you get motivated by all your successes. And there's kind of this positive feedback loop, right? It's not that, you know, by the time you're 22, it matters that you're 10 months older. By that point, it doesn't matter. But it's the it's the training and the reinforcement you got when you were very young and identified as a hockey star because of the advantage you had then. And I wonder about that in, in this kind of case where, as far as I know, nobody thinks that like long run boys or girls have very different IQs or that, that it, or maybe if it's like a couple points different, that that's even significant in any way. But I wonder if it's a case of girls very early on are just better equipped to handle school. And so they learn that they get sell, they get positive reinforcement at school and it's it's kind of a fit for them because especially elementary school teachers tend to be very, very female. And so it's like a welcoming environment and boys get kind of the opposite message. And even though they have equal ability in the long run, there's kind of this like being set on a path, like path dependency feature to it. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. And it, and uh, I think we can we can risk, I think, with you, Jeremiah, being a bit wonky here. The, because there's a couple of things going on there. One is the possibility that you just it's, accum it's an accumulated problem, right? Right from the off, you're identifying you know, certain people who are gonna who are ahead and going to benefit more from more investment, which is the Gladwell thing, particularly for athletics. And another is just you're just behind developmentally at various points. And of course, both those things can be true at once. But what what Gladwell's book found was that being relatively older in your school year meant that you were bigger, <laughs> you just obviously about athletics in particular, bigger and stronger and more advanced and so on, which meant you were going to get picked for the team, which meant you were going to get more coaching. And so like basically it was like from the off, you were at this advantage relatively. But the interesting evidence is that the big effect is in academics is being absolutely a year older. It's not so much where you are in the relative age distribution in the class, it's just being a year older. And that's because your brain is... <laughs> Is you're more mature. Your brain has, has matured more. And one of the one of my suggestions is that we should actually start boys in school a year later than girls. That that should be the default. And it's not so much because that would change the the starting conditions, which would then accumu accumulate. Although that is part of it. It's mostly because of what happens ten years later. It's mostly because of the difference between a fifteen and sixteen year old boy and a fifteen and sixteen year old girl. And that's when the big gaps emerge. And it is just, that's just a neuro, neuroscientific difference. And so my view is that if we were to start boys in school a year later, and just in absolute terms, they would be relatively older than the girls, but that's not really what would matter. What would matter is they're just absolutely a year older, which means that their brains have literally had an extra year to grow. And it's important that it, the, the brain is growing in these areas which, which tend to facilitate these non-cognitive skills. It is like behavior, deferring gratification, managing your own risk, impulse control, all that kind of stuff is what's later to develop in boys. It's not smart. As you, as you say, there's no difference really in IQ at any age particularly. And whilst girls are just trouncing boys in GPA, actually boys and girls are pretty equal on SAT and ACT. And so to the extent that those are measuring cognitive ability, there's not much difference. There's not much to see there. So it's important. It's not that girls are smarter than boys or vice versa. It is that girls develop skills 
earlier and more quickly that allow them to apply their intelligence through organization, etc. GPA is a great measure of those sorts of skills, of non-cognitive skills, as much as it is of intelligence. And so it's important, I think, to get those things separated because their education system, quite rightly, in my view, rewards those other skills as much as it does raw intelligence. There's no good being smart if you're just going to drop out of high if you're just going to drop out of college three years in. You actually got to turn up, do the work. Yeah, there's a whole field of debate, I guess. Or, or I don't think it's a field. It's just this debate about, you know, what really matters. Is it raw intelligence and your SAT score and your IQ? Or is it your diligence and your willingness to stick to something? And, you know, like when, when we talk about getting a high school degree or getting a college degree, what are we actually measuring? Right. Are we measuring someone's intelligence or are we measuring their conscientiousness and their willingness to go through four years of, of work that, that's yes. not super fun? Yeah. Uh, it, yeah. And so that's, that's a whole thing. Yeah, and that's um, more that, – I mean, and it is, it is more conscientiousness that's being rewarded. It is the ability to stick with it. And interesting when you get to college – one of the reasons why we see lower college completion rates for men isn't just that they enroll less. It's as much about the fact that having enrolled, they don't finish. They drop out. Uh, and actually, if you look at, if you conditional on enrolling in four-year college, women are 10 percentage points more likely to have graduated four years later than men. That's conditional on enrolling. Now, they're about 10 percentage points more likely to enroll. But even among those who enroll, there's a huge gender gap in whether or not four years later they've got a, there's a slightly smaller gender gap six years out. But there's a sort of, you know, girls and young women just seem to be able to sort of march their way through this very linear education system that rewards the ability to do that much more strongly than, 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 than boys. They're more likely to graduate high school. They're more likely to go straight from high school to college, conditional on enrolling college. They're more likely to finish on time. And so they're just quite linear. They're, they're just marching through, whereas the guys are dropping out, stopping out, struggling, changing major, just, just zigzagging a bit more than the women. And it's partly just because of the skill difference. One of the stats that's used in the book is that for every 100 women graduating from college with a bachelor's degree, there are only 74 men graduating from college with a bachelor's degree. But you do still hear about areas where, you know, there's a lot more men than women, you know, there's fields like computer science and physics and things like that, um, typically STEM fields, and especially the, the hard math fields, so to speak, tend to be dominated by men. Is is there a sense of why that happens? You know, because we're talking about gender and education here, and, and the, the broad brush of like, there's a lot more women in college than men can, uh, can, hide some uh, heterogeneity there yeah so there's there are still some some differences for sure in terms of the sort of degrees that people are getting i think it's worth pointing out that in many areas that were traditionally seen as male actually women have caught up so in things like law medicine etc and, and even in some of the traditionally more stemmy subjects uh, women have now caught up with men or are very close to doing so so actually in computer science i don't I don't know those numbers, but they are still minority female, but rising. Overall, if you look at STEM subjects, women now account for about 36% of the undergraduate degrees. And some of the higher numbers are in physical sciences, 41% of those degrees now go to women and 42% of the degrees in mathematics and statistics now go to women. Now, of course, that's that's less than half. And given that women account for almost 60% of the degrees, compared to their overall college representation, those are still low. But we've seen a very significant increase in them. And in fact, then when you go out into the labor market, most scientists in the US now are female. And that's, you know, these are extraordinary uh, changes just in a few decades into these STEM subjects more generally. But it does seem like in some cases there's been a bit of a leveling out. So things like computer science, actually there were more women uh, doing computer science degrees uh, just a couple of decades ago than there are now. It sort of peaked and then fell off again. And so we might at some point start to hit some genuine differences in levels of interest and preference. This is obviously a slightly controversial topic, but, but it, the evidence seems quite clear to me at least that with huge distribution overlap, there are differences between men and women in some of their innate interests and preferences. And so some of that will play out. I don't think we'll necessarily see a world where 50% of engineering students are female and 50% of nursing students are male. 
but we can do a darn sight better than the current numbers, which are about 15% of, of engineers are women and only about 10% of nursing students are, are men. And so, so, yeah, there may be some limits, uh, even under conditions of perfect kind of equality and choice, but we're a long way from those limits now. I want to spend some time also talking about the job market, because the job market is something that you definitely mention in the book quite a lot. And, you know, I can imagine some of my female listeners here kind of getting to the point where they're like, okay, you know, I, I recognize this is a problem and we should care about men struggling in education. But what is he going to talk about the job market? Like the gender pay gap definitely still exists. And so, you know, how can you write a book about how men are struggling in the job market? So, you know, assuming that those someone would have that objection and it's it's presented in good faith, how would you put the case for what's going on with men in the labor market and why it troubles you? Yeah. So the first thing I would say is, again, it's possible to think two thoughts at once. So I am I am worried about the gender pay gap and think we need to do more work on it. At the same time, I'm worried about the college gender gap and we should work on on that. And I think overall, my view is that the education system is structured to favor women and girls and the labor market is structured to favor boys, uh, to favor men, and that we, both of those are a problem and both of them should be tackled. And that it's it's a false choice to say that you can, you're only allowed to care about one seems to me to be a false choice. And by the way, that's true. I mean, there are plenty of conservatives who are really, really going on and on about problems of boys and men, but uh, and they say the gender pay gap's a myth, don't need to worry about that, and vice versa. Whereas, of course, both things can be true at once. And so then the question becomes like, what's going on in the labor market? And why am I worried about it? Well, I'm worried about some men in the labor market, but not all. Men at the top of the labor market are doing pretty well. Men at the top of the distribution, and this overlaps with some of my previous work that you and I have talked about before, men at the top of the labor market are doing better than men at the top of the labor market were in 1979. But most men are not. Everyone go read Dream Hoarders. Go order Dream Thank Hoarders right you. now. Thank you. That's right. Go <laughs> slip in the old book as well. <laughs> like, I think it's an important economic fact that most American men today earn less than most American men did in 1979. They're actually gone backwards, to the, and that means that the median and up to about sixty percent of men are now are actually economically in a slightly worse position than men were half a century ago. You said something in the book about how virtually all of our economic growth since the seventies can be attributed to women in the labor force, and and you know that's really one of the biggest drivers that men have not, you know, wages are not going up, and you know it's it's really a story about women getting more productive and working more. Yeah, it's, I mean, that's especially true in middle class families, where actually, you know, if you take the middle 60% of the distribution, essentially, the only reason that they've seen any income growth at all is because of the increases in both women's levels of employment, and in their earnings. But for those at the top, the story is pretty different. I mean, there you've seen like women's women's wages have, have risen across the board, you know, by at the median by about 30% over that period was a drop for men. But at the top, it's like 70%. At the 90th percentile, men, it's like 30, 40%. And so like men and women, women at the top and men at the top have seen their incomes and earnings growing quite strongly in recent decades. And then, of course, they very often bring those earnings together into joint households because marriage rates are much higher at the top of the distribution as well. And so that's really driving a lot of this economic inequality. And so what this means we have to do is, th is think in different dimensions at the same time. The gender pay gap is a measure of what's happening at the median. But it's also true that 40% of women now earn more than the median man. And in 79, it was only 13% of women. I have a chart in the book where I show the female and uh, male wage distributions in 79 and today. And in 79, you're just like, they're, just, they're very different. Right? You say, okay, that, those, those are different wage distributions. But today, you, you do have to squint quite hard to, to see that difference in gender pay gap. It's there. But what's happened is we've seen massive growth in economic inequality, really stubborn and remaining race, race gaps, and a gradual decline in the gender gap. And so what that means is that you've got to think about this like, in these different dimensions at the same time in order to understand what's going on. And, the, and then I don't know how much time we're going to spend on this, but then we've got to say, okay, all of that's true, fine, but there's still a gender pay gap. Yes, there is. And it's not a myth, as people say on the right, so it's not a myth. But it's, I mean, it's math. It's just there in the data. The question is why? And the big answer is kids. 
the gender pay gap is really a parenting pay gap. And so when I said earlier that the labor market is structured in favor of men rather than women, to be more precise, the labor market is structured against carers of children who are still predominantly women. And so the main reason we see this gender pay gap is because women's earnings and employment behave very differently after having children compared to men. If you look at the earnings charts of men and women, they basically track each other up until about the age of 30, and then kaboom, something happens to women, and that thing is children. Uh, and so what I think that speaks to is the way the structure of the labor market really heavily penalizes mothers, and it is still women mostly doing it, compared to fathers. And so if we're serious about the gender pay gap, then we have to get serious about the way in which we balance work and family life. And my view is that we've completely changed the family so that most couples both work now. Women are the main breadwinners in 40% of households. As I just said, 40% of women earn more than most the median man. We've completely transformed the way in which women and men are engaging in the labor force. But we haven't really changed our labor market institutions. And we're continuing to truck along as if we still had the traditional family. And what that means is that women are paying a very high price if they take time out of the labor market to care for children. Do you think it's a factor at all when we talk about men's, you know, stagnation in, in labor market outcomes, in, in their jobs, and especially as we're talking about lower and middle class men, upper class men are fine, they're doing great, we're, we're all we're great. But lower and middle class men, you know, working class families, they're struggling more. Do you think that kind of the, the shift in our economy away from things like steel mills and manufacturing and kind of these primary outputs and towards services, do you think that that's a factor here in explaining why women's incomes have risen so dramatically and, and men's incomes have not? Yes, and thank you for putting that on the table. I should have I should have said that before, Jeremiah. That um, you are we are seeing these kind of huge shocks to the labor market, um, particularly because of free trade and automation. You know, trends that I think both you and I would support overall, but which have clearly had a disproportionate. I should also say, just because I always say this, like manufacturing is not gone from America. We still manufacture a lot. It's just no. that we're manufacturing slightly increased volumes of stuff. With far fewer people. We've gotten better. With we're people. efficient at that's it. That's right. And so it doesn't employ as many people as it used to. That's, that's right. There's a big difference between measures of manufacturing as a share of the economy and manufacturing employment as a share of the labor market. And there's been a very st steep decline in manufacturing employment um, because, as you say, because of greater, greater efficiency in automation. And so what we've seen is that some, some of the changes in the labor market have disproportionately affected traditionally male jobs. And what they've particularly done is taken away some of the jobs that men could do re with reasonably modest levels of education and still get decent earnings. And so to the extent that people say, oh, well, but men don't need to get education. You know, there are plenty of jobs for men that pay really well without education. Well, that's less and less true. That was true. It's true as a matter of history, but it's not true as a matter of the present, certainly not of the future. So there's been a shift in the economy for sure in ways that as things stand tend to disfavor men which means that we need to work much harder to help men adapt to the changes that are happening. So it's really important not to see the success of women in the labor market and the position of men in the labor market as a zero-sum game. That's kind of old-style lump of labor theory. Oh, well, if men's, men's look, look at men's wages. They're not doing well. Women's wages are doing great. Oh, look at male labor force participation going down and women's going up. You know, but it's not because one is not happening because of the other. Uh, they're happening in tandem, but they're not happening because of the other. And so the the politics of this are very important to get right, because I think there's a danger that the way people think about this is they say, well, of course, men are doing worse. You know, women have taken the jobs. <laughs> you know, that's a very crude way to put it. But that's just absolutely not true. What's happened is that women's economic rise has coincided with the series of economic shocks that have disproportionately affected men. Another thing I want to tackle, and I, I wish we could spend more time on the labor market, but you know, I, I don't want to keep you here for three hours, um, so I'm gonna move. I'm gonna move us along briskly here. But another thing that I, I want to tackle is kind of the role of the family and and the role in society of how we see men. And this is obviously a little bit fuzzier. It's a little bit more sociological, and and there's you know less like hard economic modeling and statistics involved here, but I'll, I'll try to paraphrase a point that I think you make in the book. And, and you can tell me if I'm doing it poorly or not, but it seems like we basically had this old model of patriarchy 
it definitely was unequal and bad in many ways. It was unfair to women it, as a very obvious statement. And it's a good thing that we got rid of that whole, like, the man is the man of the household. He's the breadwinner. The woman stays home and she's the nurturer. And, you know, and that's the only way a family can be. It, it, it's not, it's good that we've gotten rid of that. But we've gotten rid of this kind of model of what a, a man is and what masculinity is. And it's not clear that we've replaced it with anything. I think that's exactly the right way to frame it, which is that there was there was this old model which had very clear roles and very clear scripts for men and women. It was the world of my parents. So my dad knew he was going to be the breadwinner. That's why he bothered to get a bit more educated. And when he became unemployed, we knew he was the one that had to find a job. My mom was knew she was going to be the main carer, even though she worked a bit too. It was quite clear what the division of labor was, even even though it was a very socially egalitarian relationship. Economically, it was like massively not so. And so the old the old model of the family was based on the economic dependency of women on men, and it therefore tied men to children via women. And it had some advantages. Everyone had a pretty good idea what their role was. It was pretty stable. By definition, if you're economically dependent, then it's going to tend to stick around. And it wasn't bad for kids, partly for that reason. And it meant that mothers and fathers were more often than not in their kids' lives, although fathers were obviously not in, in the same way. The fatal flaw was that it was massively unfair and that it required, the, in fact, the economic subjugation of women uh, to men in order to make it work. And the feminist movement, post-war feminist movement, correctly identified that as the key goal, secure economic independence. If you read Gloria Steinem, Margaret Mead, it's quite clear, make marriage a choice, not a necessity become economically independent. And then, and then from that, pretty much everything else will flow. I think you're absolutely right about that. And there's been extraordinary progress towards that goal, such that I think we can say that we're really quite close to it now in many advanced economies. That's great because what that's done is expanded the role of women and it's given women a new script. They torn up the old script and give them a new script of economic dependence, educational empowerment, etc. At the same time, we've torn up the old male script, which is you're going to be needed as a breadwinner. Women are going to need you. Right, they're going to have to marry you in order to raise kids, uh, and that's going to be your role. Uh, so we've torn that up as well, but we haven't replaced it. So what we've done is we've torn up both the old female script and the old male script, but we've provided a really new, powerful female script, which is expansionary and empowering. But we haven't replaced the old one for men. And so what that means is that in a world of much greater gender equality, the danger is that fathers start to be seen as surplus to requirements, and they get benched. And that turns out to be very bad for everybody, not least the men themselves, but also for the women who end up having to raise the kids on their own and for the kids who don't benefit from a strong relationship with their father. So it's a, it, is, it is a bit of a, a vicious cycle in that sense that it goes round and round. But the, the basic point is that we have not updated our model of fatherhood to be compatible with this new world of gender equality. And I think that's a real, real cultural failing. I do want to note, I caught the uh, subjugation of women line there, a, a nice ah. male reference. Um, so <laughs> Yes, I, I wondered if you'd noticed that. <laughs> Richard has also written a book on John Stuart Mill. You should all go read that or, or, or hell, just go read, go read Mill. Subjugation Mill. of women is, is not very Mill. long. You, yeah. can, you can read it in a couple hours. So go, go do your homework, children. Uh, this is another thing. We're having to encourage <laughs> men to do their homework. So <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And then turn it in. Yeah, yeah. Tell me about it. Like I think I don't know. I think I I think I've got this line in the book where it's like the bunch of people. So, you know, my ideal reader in some ways is the person that went on the women's march and then scuttled home to see if their son had done his homework, uh, which in my <laughs> case he had not. But it's that's like that's that's kind of a target market in a way. I think this is relevant to things that are not purely economic or educational. You know, things like the deaths of despair and and men having higher suicide rates and men mm. you know having more opioid deaths and just there's a lot of these kind of cultural things that are not purely just related to how much money you make that are, you know, men are struggling. And mm. I think that something about the role of men in society is is contributing here. And it's really tough to talk about this because I, I think when you talk about this, you very quickly risk getting into Jordan Peterson land or Andrew Tate land because of what, what you we've said about how you know, just the left has been focused for so long, and, and probably rightly so, but they've been focused for so long on women's issues that the only people who want to deal with men's issues are are kind of these right wing people whose solutions are like, you know, go back in the kitchen, you know, or blame women or like return to the patriarchy right. or 
you know, kind of this stuff that it's not going to happen. No, it's like it's it's reactionary in the really proper sense of that term, that it's reacting against some of the changes of recent decades, economic, social, cultural, looking for someone to blame, you know, very often finding in feminism or the progressive left. What that means is there's a lot of finger pointing and not enough helping hands. And to the extent that you're right that some of this is cultural and it's difficult to get at statistically, but some of these issues like suicide, opioid deaths much higher among men, partly because they tend to die alone. That's one of the reasons opioid deaths overall are higher. I see them as really important problems in and of themselves, but also as symptoms of this broader problem, this cultural redundancy that many men feel, this sense of how valuable am I in a society that doesn't appear to need me anymore. And that's a, that's a real problem. Uh, I actually came across this study by Fiona Shand and her colleagues that was published in the British Medical Journal, where they looked at the words that men use to describe themselves before committing suicide or attempting suicide, and the top two words were useless and worthless. And if the land that you just referred to, the land of Jordan Peterson, the land of Andrew Tate, if that's actually the land of male struggle, male suffering, male uncertainty, male disorientation, well, it shouldn't be their land. That should be our land. And it's only because we are not on, in that land that they have been able to come in. And to that extent, we're really reaping what we're sowing here. If we don't update our priors quickly enough and we don't actually reach out and have some solutions for some of these, these men and the boys and, and rec just recognize that the problems are real. These are not the fevered imaginings of you know, misogynist men. But if we dismiss them as such, enter the populist right, enter Jordan Peterson. And, and to give Peterson his due, he does at least provide a massive listening ear. And anybody that doesn't pay attention to a book that sells 4 million copies and to a man that when he goes on tour has to fill out Wembley Stadium in London is not being serious about what's happening in society. And so there's demand. I, I look at Peterson and see like there's almost like two different Jordan Petersons. Like there's the very almost, to, to reuse a word here, the banal Jordan Peterson, who's like, you know, clean up after yourself. Clean, this is the clean your room guy. You know, make your bed. That's the bit I want. That's the bit I wanted my kids to take pay attention to. Of course, they'd read Twelve Rules for Life. I said, like, well, it didn't make any difference. You're still not making your bed. But yes, some of it's straightforward. Yeah, and it's it's just very basic. Yeah. Like have some. You know, it's you know back in the fifties, it, it's the dad smacking you on the back of the head and saying, have some self respect. You know, and and in that sense, that seems fine. But then there's the Jordan Peterson who is, you know, like, well, all differences between men and women are biologically ingrained. Yeah. And women are built to problem. be baby making machines and men are yeah. built to be, you know, the protect like and, and then all sorts of trans stuff and, you know, I I don't know, like yeah. where it's very just, obviously a little uglier and uh, Yeah, he just I mean some of it is he thinks out loud, so he's bound to say some crazy stuff. Um and but also I mean, my main criticism of him is twofold. And this this actually stands in as a good criticism, I think, of many conservatives, which is first of all, there's too much focus on the individual. I mean the left does the same thing, but from a different side, which is to say, okay, the problem is with you. You just need to stand up straight with your shoulders back, make your bed, you know, get yourself together, be more of a man. Um, but you, you're saying they're blaming individual men. Well, basically. I mean, I, I see in Peterson's case, I don't see he's blaming them, um, but it is. But he is putting responsibility for fixing their problems pretty squarely on their shoulders. And of course, like individual responsibility is important. But and he's a psychologist but by background, so like let's try to be fair here. What I think he doesn't do is say is recognize the ways in which the structures around those men in society, in the economy, in the family, in the education system are actually making life much harder for them. And so by individualizing the problem, he can only go so far. And the second mistake I think he makes is to overweight the importance of biology to explain away gender differences. And that's made much easier, of course, if you have opponents on the left who deny the existence of biological differences. So if, if you have people on the left saying there are no biological differences between men and women beyond the physical, that makes it real easy for Jordan Peterson to sound sensible. Because, of course, the truth is, yes, there are some differences, but the distributions overlap, and most of them aren't as anything like as consequential as Peterson claims. But his claims actually are more resonant if there aren't people saying, yeah, there are some differences, but they're nothing like as big as Jordan says. And by the way, they're not that consequential, and they shouldn't affect how we treat individuals, and they definitely shouldn't affect how we structure public policy. So even if you think that on average women are a bit more nurturing than men, 
and that men are a little bit more into things than people, should that affect how you recruit into careers like nursing, education, engineering? My son's an early years teacher, and I'm pretty, pretty furious if someone denied him a job because they said, well, I'm sorry, but on average, men are less nurturing. And equally, you know, my sister-in-law is an engineer, and I'd be pretty angry if someone said, well, you know, you know, women and girls just aren't into that kind of stuff. So, you know, no need to apply for this job. I'd be quite rightly furious in both those cases. But it doesn't mean that everything else equal, we're going to get to 50-50 in those professions. It just So again, it's just this inability to have nuance in such a culture war kind of environment where it's either A or B. And if you give these people an inch, they'll take a mile. So I'm not going to give them an inch, even if it makes me sound like a crazy person. And I genuinely think anybody that thinks we can explain away differences, say, in CEO leadership or in politics through biology, differences between men and women, sounds crazy. But I also think anybody that denies that there are any biological differences between men and women sounds equally crazy. And so right now, as you sometimes get your choice of crazy in the culture wars, and most people are like, no, they're both crazy. Yeah, I mean, the biological stuff is... Obviously, some of it's true, but then, like, I, I think I'm agreeing with you. Where if somebody comes to me and says, like, physically, men have more testosterone, and and they have more testosterone exposed during adolescence, and this makes them take more risks, and you know, like, okay, yeah, I buy that. That's a yeah. brain chemistry thing we can measure. Yeah. If somebody That's comes true. to me and says, like, well, yeah. men should be CEOs more because evolutional psychology tells me. That, you know, back back when men yeah. were leading hunts with spears and rocks in the olden days, you know, the men were the ones <laughs> yes. who evolved leadership traits. And so it's just evolution that men are CEOs. Like some of the evolutionary psychology you should shit you see is like wild like that. Like, you know, it's 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 the it's the most I incredible know, storytelling. A, but it's great. And that's it. And, and the trouble like the inability to look at how d- distributions overlap and different distributions overlap to different degrees. So. The fact that men are responsible for 95% of violent crime in every known human society probably tells us something about a biological difference. Uh, And actually, Carol Hooven's book on testosterone, I think, is very good on this. I think it's very balanced and very fair and looks at the the impact that testosterone has on the way people feel around potential for aggression and sex. But the idea that doesn't mean culture doesn't matter is, first of all, crazy. Otherwise, why have we seen a halving in violent crime in recent decades? And why are there such massively different levels of violent crime in one country right next to another country, right? That suggests to me that culture is pretty darn important here. And in fact, the acknowledgement of nature doesn't make culture less important. It makes it, it makes it more important. But then you get other things like, say, the people-things distinction, you know, women a bit more into people, men into things. That does seem to be true on average across populations, but that distribution hugely overlaps. And so what that might mean, and there's a very good study I cite in the book by Rong Su and James Rounds, which says, take what we know about male and female personalities and use that to map onto the occupational structure. And what would it look like? And what they find is that about 30% of engineers would be women and about 30% of nurses would be men. Not 50%, because if you take current personality preferences, then, then actually they are sufficiently different that you'd get to 70-30 in those two professions. But right now, only 15% of engineers are women and only 10% of nurses are men. So we have a long, long, long way to go. And the problem is with some of the ways that biology is used is it's used to, dis- to explain why, why there's only 5% of engineers are women or why there's only 40 women leading C- C- as CEOs of major companies. And so I really desperately, it's, why, it's one of the reasons why I included the chapter on biology in the end, but I really desperately want us to get to a position where we can just say, look, there are some differences that might mean we see some different patterns in decision making, but those differences are going to be much, much smaller than many of the current gaps that we see. And I'm afraid that by denying any differences at all, it actually strengthens the arguments of the people on the right who are overemphasizing biology. So we've gotten to the point in the podcast where we're going we're gonna to mirror the book. And the last chapter of every nonfiction book is the policy recommendation. Uh, what should we do about this? And, and you certainly spend a lot of time focusing on that. And so as we bring the podcast to a close, and we've got just a little bit of time left, I want to talk about what we do about some of these issues. We've already talked about the idea of redshirting um, young boys right as they go into the school system. One thing that I think stood out to me was this discovery that you kind of made in your research process that policies tend to not work. Like in general, just all policy kind of seems to have this blockage where it seems to work for girls 
and not for boys. And and obviously I'm exaggerating a little bit here, but can you can you explain this idea, what you found in that interventions through policy seem to not be helping boys in many cases? Yes. Uh, first of all, I just want to I want to correct something in what you just said, Jeremiah, which is that it's not the last chapter of my book. It's the last three chapters of my book. <laughs> it's a whole uh, it's a whole part of the book. And and that the reason I say that is is because actually there are so many books that suffer from what Yasha Monk calls the chapter 11 problem. You have 10 chapters of problem and then your editor says, well, you better have a few solutions. So you tack on a chapter at the end saying, um, let's have universal pre-K. Uh, it's national national service would be a good idea or whatever it is. I didn't want to do that because there are so many books on boys and men, frankly, from different angles, and of of course, mine's the best. <laughs> uh, but but they don't have many solutions. They don't have many solutions. Like they're a bit they're a bit like the secular equivalent of the Book of Lamentations. And I, I really think we've got to get past the lamentation stage and into the solution stage. And so I spent quite a lot of time, as you rightly point out, on solutions. And and I think that's important to the project to get on to arguing about solutions rather than continuing to argue about whether there's a problem here. And so in education, of course, as well as redshirting, I think that we need a huge recruitment drive for male teachers to the extent that male teachers do seem to help boys in particular and black boys with black male teachers especially, then I think we need a massive drive. The way that we're trending towards uh, an increasingly female teaching profession is it, in my view, something that should be addressed and not ignored. And so particularly male teachers in things like English and in the early years, and as I mentioned, male, male teachers of color, though I actually think that should become a national priority, honestly. And if that re requires us to have male scholarships into teaching, great. We've had plenty of female scholarships into STEM, continue to support that. But I think we now need some the other way. And also much bigger investment in vocational education and training, because as you said a moment ago, many of the educational interventions that we've had and in training and in some cases employment just seem to work better for women and girls. That does seem to be true. That just sort of gender neutral policies tend to work better for women and girls. I think because of the motivation factors we talked about earlier. Vocational education and training is an exception to that rule. Actually, that does seem to help boys and men more. And so I call, for example, the creation of a thousand new technical high schools in the US, which could almost double the number of students who can go to a technical high school to about 15%. That would cost the federal government, you know, by rough calculations, if they were to subsidize the states to do about 5 billion uh, a year. Now, 5 billion sounds like a lot until you think about the fact that it's 1% of the college loan forgiveness program. So for 1% of the cost of writing off college loans, we could have a thousand new technical high schools. I think that would be a good deal. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is going to be my favorite new rhetorical tool is, you know, well, we spent 500 billion forgiving, you know, all this student debt. And so my program is actually very cheap in comparison. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the nice thing. That's the nice thing about a gigantic a program like that, especially if it's not all that well targeted, or I mean, better than it could have been, but is that it makes everything else seem incredibly like, or what about? Ex excuse you, Richard. It It is very well targeted at Biden's activist base. Well, that's so. true. And, <laughs> and of course, and of course, relevant to this discussion, it's disproportionately helpful to women to the extent that uh, Elizabeth Warren described it as a gender justice issue because two thirds of college debt is held by women. I I gotta say I'm just I'm still so struck by the the policy interventions don't work on men kind of idea that it, mm -hmm. and you know and you, obviously you've got some that you think will that you think are specifically helpful yeah, but some it do. was it was another one of those moments in the book where I was just you know there's again everybody's gonna have to buy the book to read all there's like a full list yes. of these um so definitely go buy the book but you know like the the famous Kalamazoo promise thing where every high school graduate in Kalamazoo, Michigan, gets their college paid for by some anonymous benefactor. And this, like, greatly increased the number of girls going to college from Kalamazoo and had no impact on boys. And, like, this kind of is just repeated over and over. And I don't know, it, it was one of those things, again, that just kind of struck me really forcefully. And I'm wondering, like, how do we know that some of the things that you're proposing would actually work and would actually make a difference. Yeah, so I think the way I interpret the so the, the Kalamazoo one, you're right. So the increased college completion rates by about fifty percent among women, which is a huge effect, uh, but this didn't increase at all, zero for men, uh, which meant that actually on a cost benefit analysis, it was it lost it cost money uh, for men. 
um, because it was quite expensive but didn't actually increase their college completion. And the reason it was expensive was because quite a lot of the men did start college and just didn't finish. It was, re- it was less an enrollment issue, actually, more a completion issue. And I, we've already touched on some of the reasons that might be true. And so what that identifies, I think, is that just putting in place a, a sort of gender, a gender blind policy doesn't necessarily help both men and women. And this could, of course, be true the other way around, too. And so I think it's important to look at, like, what was, what was the heterogeneity of the impact? And the more I dug into this, I kind of discovered these scholars like Josh Angrist and Melanie Wasserman, David Orter and people like that. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, this is quite well known. You know, in the evaluation literature, yeah, this, this difference in gender and practice is quite well known. We should look more at that. And I said, well, I didn't know. It's one of the reasons I ended up writing the book, actually, because everyone I talked to said, oh, I didn't know. Um, you know, and I live in policy wonk land, and yet it's not very well known. And so what that means, I think, is that if to the extent that the the challenges the girls and women have are different to the challenges for boys and men, that does mean we need some more gender aware or gender specific policies that will help those particular groups and so the things that will seem to help that will help boys more red shirting didn't you know actually a a delayed start in school doesn't really seem to make much difference for girls it does seem to make a difference for boys more male teachers doesn't seem to affect girls does affect boys um technical and vocational training seems to really help boys doesn't seem to help help it doesn't it doesn't harm girls at all but doesn't seem to give them any additional benefits so there's a bunch of policies which everything else equal are actually going to be more useful to boys and men and therefore should be, in my view, targeted towards them. It doesn't mean that they would be restricted to them, but it would mean that you'd be aware going into it, like here's a policy that's going to help them more. In just the same way that the Democrats are aware that cancelling student debt will really help women. And so it's it's okay to know that because then what you're doing is you're trying to say, okay, so who will this policy help? And is that the group who we most want to help with this particular policy? Uh, and and it's it's it is striking how different policies will affect different groups differently. And the other things in the solution space, I'll say, just briefly, partly so that we can finish the podcast, but also so that people will still go read the book, is to get more men into these heal professions: health, education, administration, and literacy, including teaching, but also nursing, psychology, social work, etc. Most of which have become significantly more female oriented over time. And it's where a lot of the jobs are coming from. So I estimate that for every job we're going to create in a STEM field, we're going to create three jobs in one of these heel fields. And so just in terms of employment, it's important, but also providing services to both men and women, it's important. And then in terms of fatherhood, my two big proposals are to have equal paid leave for mothers and fathers. I have this eye-wateringly utopian ideal that it could be six months for, for each but crucially the design is such that it's attached independently to the mother and the father so if the father doesn't take it then it doesn't get taken and i think that's an important signal the fatherhood matters in and of itself um as well as motherhood albeit in a different way and that paid leave should be available all the way through kids childhood my brother actually just took his parental leave in the uk when his kids were teenagers because he thought that's when he's got sons And he thought, actually, that's when he's going to be able to be most useful to them. And there's some pretty good evidence to support that, that dads seem to be particularly good around, you know, in terms of raising adolescents. And so let's not restrict it to the early years, right? There's a bit of early years determinism in public policy now, whereas adolescence is this crucial period where actually it may well be that dads have a particular role to play there. So let's not restrict the pay leave to the early years. Let's make it available to both mums and dads and throughout childhood. I've got a question there because I, I agree with a lot of what you're saying, but I find myself running into kind of a paradox when I do. And that paradox is this, like, I I kind of agree the best possible world, the best future that we can be aiming at is the one where, you know, men and women split childcare more equally. And, And maybe it's never perfectly equal because women are the ones who literally have to give birth to the babies. And there might be some, some biological reason why they're slightly more, you know, in slightly more just, uh, predisposed to care for children, but we get it to at least 60-40 or to something really close to equal. I agree that's good and we should aim for that. But then I also, you know, worry about how it's a problem. It's presented as a problem earlier in the book that like male labor force participation rates have been declining for decades. You know, they were 95% you know, back in the 50s or the 60s or whatever. And as women's labor force participation has been going up, it's kind of presented as a problem that men's participation is going down and fewer men are in work and we have a lot more needs, you know, not in education or training 
um, and neats are disproportionately men. And, you know, it, we kind of have this male malaise problem. And I wonder, like, wouldn't it just kind of... Are these two ideas bumping up against each other, that men should be carers more often, but then also we're worried about men's labor force participation is declining? Uh, and would one of would increasing the man's role in a parental sense, like, decrease his labor force work? And I, I don't know. I, I, I kind of find myself... I find myself worrying about both of those. Yeah, well, I think I, I think it's an it, it is an important question. Uh, the thing I'll, I'll preface it by saying that uh, I see a world where there is much more equal contributions of men and women, but across childhood, you know, um, I think maybe it's because I've raised all three of my own sons to their twenties that I realise this is a very very long business. Um, it's not over by the age of four or five, and even if we think that there is either a on average, more of a natural tendency or desire on the parts of women to care for very young children, which I think is true, that doesn't mean that they're up for the whole job. And just anecdotally, you know, I don't actually know that many mums, even the most kind of liberal feminist mums I know who are kind of annoyed at their partners for not having, for not taking as much time off in the first year of the child's life as they did. What they were annoyed about was the fact that 12 years later, they still expected her to be doing the dentist appointment <laughs> and the school runs. And, and so there's a, the, the, ten, the danger on the left is just to say any differences at all in the behaviors of men and women around childering is a sign of patriarchy and the socialization of sexism, which I don't think stands, really stands up anymore. When, when you see Harvard MBAs going part-time to care for their children, it's really hard to argue that's because they've been brainwashed into it. But that doesn't mean that that's their destiny. And so actually finding ways to think about child as a longer game is a big a big part of the argument. But your point about labor force participation is important. So I'd actually point here to work that Nick Abistat has done at the American Enterprise Institute. I don't agree with Nick about a lot of stuff, but his analysis of men not working, that's the title of his book, and he just put out a new post-pandemic edition. If the drop in labor force participation among men was because more men were caring for children, at home, I don't think we'd be as troubled by it. In fact, we'd probably, we might well be celebrating it, but that's not true. When women aren't working, when they're not in the labor market, it is typically because they're caring for children, but it's not true of men. And actually what those men are doing and how they're supporting themselves is a really tough empirical question that Nick and others have dug into. But by and large, it's not because they've become stay-at-home dads. And so there's a different reason why the male labor force participation is where it is. And if we could actually replace the number of men who are actually just struggling, we don't know what they're doing, with men who are actively engaged with raising their kids, raising their kids, that would be a massive win. But that's not the case right now. I wish it were the case, but it isn't. All right. Well, we're coming up on the end of the podcast now. And so I want to ask our traditional final question, which is, what should people do if they want to learn more? I will give the first answer here and say they should go buy the book. The book is Of Boys and Men. It's available everywhere right now. Anywhere you want to buy books, you can go buy it. So go buy the book. It's the best source. But f what are some other resources? This could be blogs. This could be academic papers. Um, it could be books, anything that you think is a valuable resource for people who are interested in the ideas that we're talking about. Yeah, so it'll be a diverse set of answers, but you've encouraged me in that direction, I think, so that's okay. First of all, Brookings now has a project on boys and men, which I'm I'm leading, and so I'd encourage people to check out the work that we're doing there. I'm a huge fan of the work of Peg, Peggy Orenstein, and she has a book, Boys and Sex, which kind of goes through some of the challenges that many young men are facing in terms of the new dating market, but, but that doesn't do justice to the book. It's a really kind of good sociological look at you know, what's happening to young men right now. And she did, she did one on girls as well and then did a follow-up. And I, I think that's a really good resource for everybody, for parents and everybody, frankly, not just for, for social scientists. And then I'll, I'll actually talk about one academic paper, which had a really big influence on me, uh, which was from a team led by Kath Catherine Eden um, and others, where they did deep qualitative work in four U.S. cities on what was happening to men. Uh, and the rise of what they call the, the haphazard self. The paper is called The Tenuous Attachments of Working Class Men. And it looks at the ways in which some of the anchors of, of work and family and religion and community have really become unmoored for a lot of men, working class men, 
uh, especially, and what does that mean for their sense of the self and their identity, and the way in which many men are having to improvise in this new world, and how if you if you're in a particularly vulnerable position, it's hard to do that. And so that paper is incredibly rich, and I strongly recommend it. All right. Well, one more time, the book is Of Boys and Men by Richard Reeves. It's a fantastic book. I happily recommend it to anybody who thinks what we're talking about is interesting and valuable. Go buy it. Go check it out. Richard, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thanks, Jeremiah.